All right, so we move into this chapter on heat exchangers. I think I budgeted three lectures for heat exchangers simply because it's so prevalent out there. Uh, if you go through a class like heat transfer, you should know something about heat exchangers. Um, we'll talk about types of heat exchangers. Won't cover them all, just introduce you to a few types. Talk about the overall heat transfer coefficient U, and maybe if we get into the log mean temperature difference, we'll get there today. So a concentric tube is just what it sounds like. You have a tube, and you have fluid flowing inside the tube. I'll color code the hot fluid is red, and we have fluid hot coming in and hot going out of a heat exchanger. But you have another tube, like that, and it's concentric. And so what we'll have here is we'll have some other fluid, maybe I color it purple, come in this area, flow in the annulus between the two tubes, and then come out on this end. So as I've shown, the flow inside of the tube is moving from left to right, and the flow in the annulus is moving right to left, and you would call that a counterflow concentric tube or double, pa double pipe uh, heat exchanger. Um, cross flow is a little harder to sketch, but it's number of illustrations in the textbook. You could have round tubes and it'll have a bundle of them and flow inside each of those tubes. Maybe we show the hot fluid in the tubes coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out, hard to show it all, but then we have maybe cooler fluid flowing across the tubes, just like you might think, cross flow heat exchanger. Uh, sometimes, um, well all, almost all the time, the tube has some surface conditioning on the inside as well as on the outside to help promote heat transfer in real heat exchangers. Um, the other thing that can happen is they could introduce a uh, finned material. Maybe you have circular fins around each of the tubes to help promote heat transfer, or you could have a plate that connects a lot of them together. And there's different configurations for that. All right, so one surface can or is often finned. It's the air side that's finned, not the water side or the refrigerant side or the liquid side. Another is a shell and tube heat exchanger. So what's the shell? Just as it might be, a big shell. And then you have a bunch of tubes, a bundle of tubes that were on, that are straight. I'm gonna show it, them being straight. It's easy to make a bunch of tubes that are straight. And the flow then would go one way down through maybe 50 tubes or 100 tubes going in that direction. How do they get into the tube? Well, you have a, basically a, a manifold here where you have fluid coming in, and the fluid coming in would then distribute and go inside each of the tubes. Well, down at the end, you have another plate, and they exit out of the tubes. They mix, and because of the end cap, they might flow back through another set of tubes, a bunch of tubes that way, maybe another 50, maybe 75, maybe 100 tubes. You could have big, large heat exchangers doing this. And then they pop out and they collect and would discharge. Here that inlet plenum and the outlet plenum are at the same end, which is convenient for servicing or hooking it up, and or you could have it on either end. Sometimes they'll have the tube bundle is a tube and it comes down and they're all U-shaped. So they have a bend in the back. The, well, that's a little harder to manufacture, but they do have them like that as well. What about the shell side? Well, you would like the fluid to come in the shell side, maybe over here, and exit over here and you'd like to promote the heat transfer between the fluids, so maybe you'd like the fluid on the shell side to go across the two bundles, then across the two bundles, across the two bundles, across the two bundles, and back out. 
How would you do that? Well, you would introduce baffles, blockages, that would then force the flow across the tubes. And I just sketch a few baffles in there. So there's a lot of shell and tube heat exchangers, different configurations, a uh, lot of cross-flow heat exchangers, different configurations. What we end up doing is we end up analyzing concentric tube heat exchangers because we can develop the mathematical framework, and then we extrapolate that framework to the more complex, which uh, then rely on empirical data measurements from built heat exchangers that are tested in the lab. One of the key parameters is going to be an overall heat transfer coefficient, U. Well, we're trying to move heat from one fluid through a material, let's say that's a barrier, that's a wall. If you're thinking about tubes, then, then it's just through the, the tube wall. And to another fluid, or maybe from hot to cold, it really doesn't matter. I sh should have maybe put hot over on the left. But anyway, you have a fluid temperature, T fluid. You have a wall temperature, let's say, on the inside. You have a wall temperature on the outside, and then a fluid temperature on the outside. So inside fluid temperature, outside fluid temperature. What do we have? We have convective resistance, 1 over HA on the inside. We have some sort of wall resistance, <laughs> RW. Uh, if it was unfinned, it just is a tube, maybe the natural log of D outer over D inner divided by 2 pi KL would be a good model for that resistance. And then convective resistance on the outside, 1 over H outside, area outside. That would be the most simple three resistors in series. And if you summed them up, you would get the total resistance, so you could replace it by one resistor, one equivalent resistor. True? And uh, what you do is you say that equivalent resistance, R equivalent, would be the sum of those three resistors. And we often in describe it by an overall heat transfer coefficient, U. One over UA is an overall resistance the equivalent overall resistance from fluid to fluid. So 1 over UA. What is U then? The overall heat transfer coefficient. Does it have the same thermal? What, the, what are the SI units for the overall heat transfer coefficient? They're the same as the H. Same as the H. So it has watts per meter squared degrees C or Kelvin. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll compute this R equivalent, and I know that R equivalent is made up of an outside through the conduction through the wall and an inside, and then I'll go back and I'll determine what percent each of these contributed to the resistance to heat transfer, and which one do you think is often negligible? Which offers a negligible thermal resistance to the heat transfer of the three components? It's through the wall. Often it's made of aluminum or uh, made of uh, copper, and often they're thin-walled materials. So it's, it's uh, easy to get that. What happens if I have some finning going on on this side? Well, what you can do is you can have the same H on the inside. Right here you would modify this term if it was finned. You'd have 1 over the convection coefficient. Often thinning doesn't change the convection coefficient. It just increases the area, doesn't it? And so this area wouldn't just be the area on the inside, but it'd be the finned area on the inside. But we know from the fins that you can have a lower temperature at the tip than at the base. And so there's a fin parameter. What is that? fin parameter. So this is how you would modify it if you had finning on one side. What is this eta naught? Overall, that's right, overall fin efficiency for that surface. And you just have to go back and review that out of chapter 3 when we talked about fins. And uh, this is the total area of that finned surface. 
you'd say that accounts for the unexposed, the exposed base as well as the fins sticking out. That's exactly right. Okay. All right. Sometimes in real applications you have fouling. Here's one slide in one class for the whole topic of fouling, and fouling is a big issue in practice. That's just the way it is. I just don't have a lot of time to explore this as a topic, but it's important. Because when you have hot oils or gases and you have deposits, some corrosion, some you know, chemical reactions happening, you can then get buildup of stuff which would not promote heat transfer but would add a resistance to heat transfer. So we have a fouling factor. What you do is you come in and you have uh, 1 over U is basically 1 over HA for the convection, but then you'd have R fouling. You're adding a resistance to fouling plus then the resistance due to the wall, etc. So how do they modify it? Well, for a bunch of different fluids and different service conditions, and these change over a number of, while it's in service, sometimes they monitor the resistance, they can detect how the, the heat exchangers are performing, and then they'll take it out of service and clean it. Physically go in there and remove the scale and remove the deposits to reduce the fouling factor, get it back to zero. All right. Well, you can see this is how the textbook reports a uh, fouling factor. What is that? Is that R double prime? Yeah, this is one of those. Be very careful right here. If I was the author of the textbook or the editor of the textbook, I would tell them, change your notation because this is in a minority. If you take a look at a lot of engineering literature, is there a double prime on this fouling factor? No. When you have Q and then you have Q prime, what was the prime on the Q often representing? Q per unit length, true? And if you had Q double prime, what did that double prime represent? Q per unit area. And sometimes Q triple prime is Q per unit volume. I know that sometimes they use prime for derivative, time derivative, you know, second time derivative, but that's not, that's in more in mathematics classes. But this is common notation to put prime, double prime, and triple prime per unit length, per unit area, per unit volume. So, but if you take a look at this, this is not what it's saying. It's not per unit area. This is the correct units of the fouling factor. It's the same as what you would find in a lot of other places. It's meter squared Kelvin per watt. So if I want to add this resistance, 1 over HA, with the wall resistance, with some fouling, where do I put the A? Do I put the A here, put the A there, or do I have the R in the right place? Do I need to put it 1 over R? What do we, see what I'm saying? I, I have a choice here. I need a resistance, a thermal resistance. The correct formula is R foul divided by A, and if you just take a look, you, SI units on that would be meters squared Kelvin per watt divided by meters squared cancels. You get how much temperature difference per watt of heat transfer. So that's our, the good units for these re thermal resistances, isn't it? Kelvin per watt. So right there, just be very careful. I find this notation a little, um, I don't know, clumsy for me conceptually. It's, it's, I wish they would just have left that off and put an F there. Just call it the fouling factor and it's a thermal resistance and when you want to use it you need to divide by the appropriate area. All right. If it's a fin surface it has a lot of area because of the finning you have to divide by that appropriate area for all that fin surface. Okay so I already talked about how to modify 1 over UA with the adding fouling right so I've already done that. Now let's talk about the temperature distributions. Let's have a soft introduction to how the heat is transferred, not jump into the math and get lost in the math quite a, right away. So if we have a concentric tube heat exchanger and it's parallel flow, what does that mean? I'm going to just kind of sketch it like this. I know that's a very simple illustration. And we'll put the hot fluid flowing from left to right going down there. And I know that the annulus, but I'm going to show the fluid, the cold fluid, just be below this box. 
and it's a parallel flow, the cold fluid is flowing in the same direction in the annulus as the fluid that's in the inner pipe or the inner tube. So we talk about the temperature hot coming in and the temperature hot going out. Which of those two hot temperatures is the lower value? The out is a lower temperature. Go back to the basics and work conceptually through these problems. How about this one? The temperature cold in and the temperature cold out. Which of those two colds is the lower temperature? The cold in is the lower temperature, isn't it? So when we plot temperature as a function of location, x, we're going to go from 0 to the length of the heat exchanger. If it was longer, it would be more area and promote more heat transfer. And we'll plot the th in, hot in, right there. And we'll start with the temperature cold in right there. What do you think the profile looks like? It could be a number of different configurations. It'll be uh, it's kind of an exponential that shape and maybe this shape. So this would be the temperature of the hot out and the temperature of the cold out. Somebody says the hot uh, hasn't gotten quite to the temperature of the cold out, has it? Let's uh, make this a very, very long heat exchanger. There it is. Now L is way out there. Could you ever have the hot coming out lower than the cold coming out? Temperature hot out could be lower. Not in a parallel flow heat exchanger. If you went counter flow, you would. Counter flow is more common but it's parallel flow that we just start with. All right. So we're going to work with uh, focusing on a little dx. And what happens in the little section dx of this heat exchanger? You could have a little dq. True? And the little dq could be represented by the local convection coefficient there times that small dA, that small area, times the, how hot it is at that location and how cold the fluid is at that location. This dA is often replaced by a PDX. What does the P represent? Perimeter. That's exactly right, the perimeter. And if I focused on the hot fluid, what would happen? Is, look, at, is the direction of positive changing x going from 0 to L, it's always in the traditional you know, left to right, isn't it? Okay. So it would be mass flow rate of the hot fluid, specific heat, oops, that's a C sub P, C sub P of the hot fluid times the temperature change of the hot fluid, the change in the temperature of the hot fluid with respect to X times DX. Well, I have to put a negative sign there because what is the slope of that line right there? It's negative. And I'm always talking about moving a positive dx in the positive x direction. All right. Um, when, so this is the dq that comes out of the hot. We also talk about a positive dq that goes into the cold. Would that be the mass flow rate of the cold, specific heat of the cold? And now the change, the question is, is we're talking about the same dq. These are all positive. These are all positive, right? Don't write one equation and say, oh, in that equation, dq is negative, and now in this equation, dq is positive. You could do it. It'd be very confusing. Don't do it. Everything on the left-hand side of all of these three equations, the equal signs are positive. All right. So now, what does... What about the change in the temperature of the cold fluid with respect to x dx? It's already positive by itself, so I just do it that way. And the first time you write this, you say, uh, why did that negative sign show up? It's confusing. It is confusing, but go slow and not be confused. Here's another thing. What we do is we often jump between 
a little infinitesimal amount of heat transfer in a small length or D area of the heat exchanger. And then we go to the global heat transfer. So we could say Q. What's Q? The total amount or the total rate of heat transfer from the hot into the cold fluid. You could write that like the mass flow rate of the hot fluid, specific heat of the hot fluid, times the temperature of the hot in minus temperature of the hot out. Is that right or wrong? Do you agree with that? How did we get that? Write a control volume just for the hot fluid and think about the Q, the rate of heat transfer coming out of that control volume which includes only the hot fluid. Do this now. Look at a control volume only for the cold fluid and think about the same positive Q but not coming out of the cold fluid but positive going into the cold fluid and write the energy balance, first law, thermo 1, for that. Would you get the same Q, this is positive, this is positive, it's the same Q, same rate of heat transfer. The mass flow rate of the cold fluid, the specific heat constant pressure of the cold fluid, ah. Temperature cold out minus temperature cold in? Good. And there's one more rate equation. We're going to drive it if I have time today, which would say Q is equal to, and it's the cousin of this one. Can you see that? Like these, this is like version A and version A, differential uh, overall, version B, differential, version B overall. This is version C, differential, version C overall. Guess what that's going to be? It's going to look like this. Well, I should have done this. Instead of an H, I should have put a U there, shouldn't I? U has the same units of H, and sometimes I'll slip and I'll put an H there when I mean to put a U. It'll be UA times delta TLM. And that's a rate equation. Each of these three equations, A, B, C, have the same Q. They're all positive. It's the rate of heat transfer from the hot to the cold. I hope I'm not beating something, you know, to death here. It's like, come on, professor, move on. Right? Okay, we got it straight. Ready for a clicker question? Oh, low. Look at that. How come it doesn't cover that up? That's supposed to cover that up. Why is that not covering it up? Well, I don't have time to figure out why it's not covering it up, but uh, which equation is not correct? And when I asked this question at 11 o'clock, I did not have perfect score. So you got 30 seconds. Which of these four equations is incorrect? Now, I forgot to mention something. This equation, uh, C, cap C right here, is, this. rule that out. It's not that one. Cap C is the heat capacity rate, which is a mass flow rate times the specific heat of the hot fluid. Only three choices for you today. Pulling has stopped. Well, are we 100% correct? Good job. Good job, good job, good job. And what was the error, the thing I'm trying to harp on? You can easily have a minus sign error. And I'm talking about a positive Q from the hot to the cold. And when you look from the perspective of the cold, it's the cold in. No, no, no. It's the cold out minus the cold in. So that was the incorrect. Thank you very much. Well, as you could tell, we get tired of writing the M dot C sub P for either the cold fluid or the hot fluid. And so when you get tired of something, you just abbreviate it. And so it's cap C. Cap C is called the heat capacity rate. We're going to have the heat capacity rate for the cold fluid as well as the heat capacity rate for the hot fluid. You ready for a clicker question? All right. Let's answer this one. What are the SI units? For the heat capacity rate, cap C, is it kilojoules, kilojoules per Kelvin, kilowatts, kilowatts per Kelvin, or something else other?
Well, uh, probably a lot of people are trying to do this in their head. What are the, what is the SI units for mass flow rate? Kilogram per second. What are the SI units for specific heat? Exactly, kilojoules per kilogram, degree C or Kelvin, either one, right? And so I asked the same question. No, I don't have time. You just cancel the kilograms. What's a kilojoule per kilowatt? Exactly, kilowatt. So what's the best answer? Isn't that the best answer? All right. Now, if we take a look at the same simple concentric tube or double pipe heat exchanger, but we go with the more common counterflow configuration, let's describe that. So what we have is think about the hot fluid on one side, and it's going to go, I'm going to show the hot fluid coming in, temperature hot in, and then the temperature hot out. But it's a counterflow. So where do we bring the cooler fluid in? The other way, the temperature cold in comes here and the temperature cold out is on that other end and now you can you can see what does this give us in this case can, is it possible to get the temperature of the hot out lower than the temperature of the cold out it is and that's why we like it and that's a very common configuration so we'll plot temperature and then we'll plot x and we'll go from 0 to L, like that, and we'll show the temperature hot in as fixed and the temperature cold in over here as fixed. And now you could sketch a number of different temperature profiles. Uh, it would be more linear, less... Uh, you could have more of a constant delta T through that heat exchanger, hence the profiles would be uh, more flat more straight lines, okay, instead of exponential shape, like this would be the direction, and this, okay. As I've shown it in this illustration, is the hot out less than the cold out? As for this problem? Yeah, yeah, so we see that. That's very good. I encourage you, we're going to get into some brutal math, and then people, oh, I just have to solve problems on exams. I'm just going to focus on the math, and I don't care about the physics or the intuition. Don't do that, because um, what you'll need to have is intuition. But there's plenty of questions that you can ask and challenge yourself and say, okay, for this type of heat exchanger, for a counterflow concentric tube heat exchanger, and I can just substitute in a whole bunch of these and just make questions. What happens if the U... What is U again? I forgot the name of U. Um, overall heat transfer coefficient for that heat exchanger. It accounts for the convection, the wall, the convection on the inside, outside, and the conduction resistance to the wall, right? What happens if that goes up? What happens to the, if, the in, if the overall heat transfer coefficient comes up, but I don't change mass flow rates, I don't change inlet temperatures, I don't change specific heats, uh, what happens to, I don't know, Q or temperature of the cold out or something like that? Do you want to play this game for a few of these? You want to try this one? So if uh, somehow U goes up without changing the fluids, the fluid flow rates, the inlet temperatures, what happens to Q? Well, the Q will increase. That's the right answer. I'm glad a lot of us had it. What does U represent? A large U is like a large convection coefficient. A large value of U means it's pretty easy to transfer the heat between the hot and the cold fluid. So it'll be easier. To, you'll get more for the same size of heat exchanger, et cetera. Somebody says, I'd like to see that in an equation. Well, you probably want to look at an equation like our rate equation, UA and then some delta T log mean. And really what you did was you boosted up U. I know that that's going to have an effect on the outlet temperatures, but, uh, but then this would go up. The primary effect would be increasing Q. Well, I don't have a lot of time to play with more of these, but we could play with them. Maybe we'll come back to them again.
it's really a good way, I think, to, to get a grasp before you get bogged down in the mathematics. A lot of times we have heat exchangers, and one fluid's either boiling or evaporating, and one, or one fluid could be condensing. That's very common in heat exchangers. Think about refrigerants in evaporators. The refrigerant is evaporating or boiling in that evaporator. In our, how about on the condenser outside the house? The refrigerant is condensing in the condenser. So it's very, very common to have that. Well, we like to work mathematically with this cap C, this heat capacity rate, which is the mass flow rate times a specific heat constant pressure. What would be an effective, not a true um, uh, specific heat, but what would be mathematically an effective specific heat if a fluid, if the fluid is either evaporating or condensing, that happens often in heat exchangers. So what do we do is we go back and say, what is our definition of specific heat constant pressure? Do you remember? Thermodynamics. The rate of change of H with respect to T holding pressure constant. H represents the property enthalpy. Okay. A little quick review. Is C sub P equal to C sub V for a liquid? Is C sub P equal to C sub V for an ideal gas? No is the correct answer for the second question. And... Yes is the correct answer for the first question. What's the difference between a liquid, it's incompressible, and an ideal gas, it's very compressible. And what's the relationship, just as a review for thermodynamics, C sub P and C sub V for an ideal gas, isn't it R? Yeah, C sub V plus R is equal to C sub P for a true ideal gas. Okay. Now, what we'll have to do is play a, a little conceptual game uh, putting at constant pressure, if you want to go back to thermo, it would be something like this. Here's a constant uh, weight piston in a gravitational field, and I have my fluid. It's trapped in here, and I'm going to just play conceptually the game of adding some heat. I'm going to add a little heat. Look at it. Add a little heat. It's constant pressure at all times. I'm going to add a little heat, add a little heat, and I'm going to plot it in a little bit of a funny way, but let's go ahead and plot it like this where... As we add the heat, something's going to go up because I'm looking at derivative of enthalpy with respect to temperature. Let's put temperature on the x-axis and enthalpy on the y-axis. I know this is a little different. I'm sure I showed this to you when I taught thermo 1 or thermo 2. But I'll start it at 20 degrees and I'll boost it to 40 degrees. How did I get it to go from 20 degrees C to 40 degrees C? Water. I'm going to do this for water. That's a fluid you're very comfortable with at 1 atm pressure, right? What happens when I do that? Does the enthalpy of the water change at all? It goes up a little bit. How about at 1 atm I go from 40 to 60, 60 to 80. I hit something magical at 100 degrees C. It's become saturated liquid, exactly. Before that, it was all subcooled liquid. But what's happening is I'm going up. The enthalpy is climbing. And then we hit this, and this value of enthalpy is H of F or H of G. I can't remember. H of F for saturated liquid. Now I continue to play the game of pumping in a little more Q. Is the temperature going to go up? Nah, not immediately. What happens? It goes from saturated liquid, a little bit turns into saturated vapor. You hold it one bar. That's what that little weight is, that constant weight piston on the top does. Oh, it expands dramatically as well. So what happens to the H? Does the H go up? The temperature's not changing, but I'm keeping in dumping in energy. Q is coming in. Q is coming in. Until I get up to H of saturated. And now if I add any more heat to it, it's impossible. No, no. You can add heat. What's going to happen to the saturated vapor? Goes to superheated vapor. And then the enthalpy 
will go up, but the temperature will go up. You'll go to 120, 140, 160, 180. You can get saturated vapor quite hot, and it'll just march right on up like that. Where is the specific heat constant pressure for the liquid water anywhere in this diagram? Isn't that it? Isn't it the slope of that line? The definition, how does dH dt at constant P, isn't it the slope? So what is C sub P for liquid water? The slope of that line will be about 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Maybe you remember that value. How about the slope of this line? That's C sub P water, but it's in the vapor phase. It's around uh, 2.1 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. True? Good review. Now we have time for a clicker question. You ready? Let's try it. Hopefully we get a lot right. What is the effective specific heat for a fluid that is evaporating? Where is it evaporating? Anywhere in this diagram. Where it goes from sat this point right here. What is that point right there? Saturated liquid to saturated vapor. Where is it evaporating? All right, so let me start the timer. What is the effective specific heat for a fluid that is evaporating? All right, so we're stopped. You go back, and I just was trying to emphasize the slope of the line on an enthalpy temperature diagram is the specific heat. The C sub P for the liquid is the slope of the line. The slope of the line. What's the slope of this line? Infinity. It's infinity. It's infinity. All right. Now I'm going to ask, this is a below the belt question. I'm just going to ask it and I'll explain it, but I don't think a lot of people will get it right. All right? All right, good. You want a challenge, huh? All right, here's a challenge for those that think my questions are too easy and too kind and all that. What is the effective specific heat for a fluid that is condensing? And we start the timer. All done? Now let me ask this question. It's its cousin question, right? I have liquid water, and I'm going to be heating the liquid water, and I'm at the temperature of 50 degrees C. Where would that be on this diagram? Right here. And I'm going to heat it up to 60 degrees C. When I heat the liquid water from 50 to 60 degrees C, maybe I use a specific heat. A value of the specific heat would be 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. True? I now want to cool liquid water from 60 back to 50. What is the specific heat for the liquid water when I'm cooling it from 60 down to 50? It was 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin on the heating. Is it negative 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram on the cooling? Isn't this a tough question? Let's do the same thing for the vapor. I'm out here somewhere in the vapor, and I conceptually heat it up. I have a positive specific heat, a positive delta T, a positive Q coming in. All I have is cooling it down. I have still a positive specific heat. I have a negative delta T and a negative Q. You want to try that question again? Same question. What is the effective specific heat of a fluid that is condensing? Well, let's just grade it. I don't know how to explain it any better, right? Isn't that true? It's infinity. Positive infinity. And let's go back to the previous, uh, how do I do that? This one. And look at that. The class is learning. Very good. 
Well, I'm out of time, but next time there's a thick derivation that I want to get into, but it's in the book, and so please read the book. Thank you very much.